Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Today's sermon that our pastor will be delivering is Grace Received, Grace Extended, and this is the text that he'll be teaching out of. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Praise God. So we'll go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful, thankful, and honored that you have given us a place that we can come together Uh, joined uh, together in you, Lord God, to worship you, to thank you for your blessings on us, Lord God, to seek your perfect will, to receive by your spirit the strength and the courage to carry out your will, Lord Jesus, as you gave us such evidence as you took on the cross, Lord God, and and obediently, Lord God, served the Father and, and saved us from our sins, Lord God, and even now are at the right hand of our Lord and Father and making intercession for us. Lord, by your grace and mercy, will you please bless us with your spirit that we might understand you, these truths. Might we hold them dear to our heart, Lord God, and bless our pastor, I pray, Lord God, during this time. I worship you and praise you and thank you for this time. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Some of you heard me. Good morning. Um, that wasn't an attempt to get you to yell at me good morning or anything like that. I literally didn't have my microphone on. So this is not VBS So uh, to do that. But it is good to be here. Uh, I will admit uh, that we are coming to Philippians chapter 2, which is a high watermark in Scripture. And it is intimidating, uh, especially when Satan attacks you with a stomach bug and you try to rebuke him. But then you think, for me to live is Christ, and as I am battling the bug to die would be gain at this moment. Uh, but God, by God's grace, uh, he has provided, and I feel I'm uh, back and better than ever. Uh, but Ocean Park, I love you. Uh, and more importantly, Jesus loves you. I had a conversation with a person who's been part of our church recently who just was so thankful how well they have been loved like Jesus through each one of you individually. So... Uh, This sermon we're about to open up uh, is how we are to extend the grace of God to one another because how we have received that grace. And so uh, this is by no means a rebuke. It is a means of keep doing what you're doing and grow in that. With that being said, uh, sometimes uh, throughout my years, I would get letters, uh, fundraising letters, Uh, from maybe schools that I've attended or organizations or institutions I've been a part of that, you know, said, well, since you benefited so greatly from the richness of the education or the experience or this uh, organization, uh, can we benefit from that by getting some of your, you know, generosity? Can you pay back uh, to pay to us what we, you received many years ago. And you probably have gotten something like that. And Paul is not doing a, a fundraiser letter per se, but this is a love-raising letter, if you, would, if you will. How to find joy in serving one another. And what's unique about Philippians chapter 2 is he actually takes the application and puts it at the beginning of the chapter. Usually I try to save the application for the end or sprinkle it throughout, but Paul pushes it all up in the front in verses 1 through 4 and then says, here's the application. Now let me tell you why I want you to do that. Here's why I want you to pay back what you have received because of what Jesus has done. So next week, we see the foundation of Christ in 5 through 11. 
But today we see the application, how Paul is calling believers to action to pay forward or pay back what they've already received. So my big idea this morning is this. Christians give to others the grace Christ has given to them. Christians give to others the grace Christ has given to them. Now, spoiler alert, the grace of God is seen most significantly and beautifully in the cross. And that's what he's going to root their application, their lives, their motivation in. The humility and the love of the cross of Christ. So what I want to do is I want to break up the text this morning in just two halves. Verse 1 is grace received. Verse 1 is grace received. Uh, Verses 2 through 4 are grace extended. Grace extended. Or you could say, if then. If you have received a great education from our institution, then would you join us in paying towards the scholarship fund. If you have received grace from Jesus, then give grace to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because Christians give to others the grace Christ has given to them. Let's take a look in verse 1 at grace received. Grace received. The Christians in Philippi... Philippi, Uh, had begun to suffer, had been called to suffer for the sake of Christ. You see verse 29 of chapter 1. But there's more to the story that Paul is pushing them. They just don't suffer for Christ. That's not the only thing we do. The Christian life is not just suffering. Those who overemphasize suffering forget the great blessings the great joys, the great comforts, the great encouragement that every single one of us have on account that we are united to Christ. So Paul says, listen, you're going to suffer for the name of Jesus, but oh, look at the blessings you have. Think of it. Verse 1, so, and that could be translated, therefore, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, four markers of the blessings that Christians have on account of their union and relationship with Jesus. Or you can say four graces that Christians have received because of Jesus. And the first one is this, and I got two sets of subpoints today, very fancy. One, he highlights if there's any encouragement in Christ. The beauty of the gospel is it holds nothing back. It looks you in the eye and it tells you the truth. It tells you the bad news, and it tells you the good news. And to do any otherwise would be dishonest and deceitful and disingenuous. And it says the encouragement that we have as believers in Christ, that we have been united to Christ, are two simultaneous truths. Two things that are true at the same time that should actually encourage us. Those two truths are one, the sheer depth of your sin, and then two, the sheer depth of the love that Jesus has for you. As you grow in Christ, you realize this sin issue, this sin thing, this is a lot bigger problem than I realized it. And that is sobering. But then, with great joy, we realize this mercy and grace of Jesus, it's a lot 
bigger and greater and glorious than I ever imagined. It blows my mind as we sang, and I think we should learn from our charismatic brothers and sisters that we should have joy when we sing. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And if that doesn't cause you to utter an amen or maybe raise your hand a little bit or say hallelujah or glory, you don't get it. Brothers and sisters, Tim Keller put it this way, and I I love this. The gospel says you are simultaneously, the two truths, more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe. You read through scripture and you realize, wow. But then he goes, yet you are loved and accepted more than you ever dared hope. Jesus knows everything about you and loves you even more. And this is such good news. And the gospel doesn't downplay this. The gospel doesn't say, listen, listen, listen. You're really not that bad. Gospel doesn't say, listen, you're overthinking things a little bit. It's a little guilt from your childhood or your society. No, the the gospel says, yes, sin is a huge foundational problem. It tells us the ugly truth. And it tells us there's nothing that we individually can do to make ourselves worthy of the calling of God. But then it puts its arm around us and says, Jesus has done everything. And when he declared it is finished, there's nothing more that needs to be done. And he has made us worthy. Paul in the book of Romans says, but God shows his love, this vast, deep over um, uh, uh, this uh, that blows our imagination that while we were still sinners not where you are today where you're becoming more like Jesus along the way but before you even had an inkling of the gospel while you shook your tiny puny little fist at heaven while you said I'll do it my way Christ died for us Since therefore we have been justified, we have been made right with God, not by our works, not by our religiosity, not by our charity, not by the things that we do or the bad things we haven't done or comparing ourselves to our crazy uncle who's out of his mind, but we have been justified by Jesus' righteous blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God towards the sin that we have committed. We look at the cross and say, that's my Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. What an incredible encouragement. And Paul says, if you have any encouragement in the good news of great joy, which is for all people, but wait, wait, wait. He gives us something else. He doesn't say if if there's encouragement, go on. He says, okay, well, hold on. Here's another thing. If there's any comfort from love, the comfort, encouragement we have that the Jesus blood is the final word and his righteousness is given to all who are within him, that we have encouragement in his life, death, and resurrection, he now turns his, uh, his attention to the Father's love. God's love is not just a comfort to us because we have escaped sin's penalty. I'm not guilty. I can leave now. It's a comfort to us that the love of God has adopted us into his family as sons and daughters of God and we are part of his kingdom and all the blessings of the glories of Jesus are now ours because we are sons and daughters of almighty God just as Jesus deserves all glory and praise and honor. We are now adopted sons and daughters, a part of that kingdom. And that comforts us. 
when we realize that we don't do things the right way, what God has called us to do, and we have the whispers that if they only knew, Jesus knows. And his blood purifies us, but he also says he doesn't send us on our way, but he brings us into his family. The Heidelberg Catechism, question one, I bring it up. I'm good every three months to quote it, but you should learn it and know it. But it says, what is our only comfort? Remember, Paul says, if there's any encouragement, if there's any comfort, what is our only comfort in this life and in death? Here's what he said, that I am not my own, but I belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't stand before God on my own because if I did, I could not stand. Who can stand before his judgment? The answer is no one. But I belong to Jesus and I stand and Jesus stands in front of me and Jesus, the Father sees his righteousness. Jesus has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and he has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also, not only that, but he preserves me. He's holding me and protecting me in his strong arms from all that would be around. He preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly father, not a hair on my head can fall. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. All things positive and all things like when Pastor John gets the news that he has a tumorous cancer. All things are working for John's salvation in this life and in the life to come. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready now to live for him. Brothers and sisters, that is such a comfort. I am not my own. I am not left to fend for myself, but I belong to Jesus God the Father loves me and the Holy Spirit is preserving me until the day I am called into my Father's eternal kingdom. But that's not it. If there's any encouragement, if there's any comfort, that's enough, right? No, no, no. Paul says if there's any participation, any participation in the Spirit, if you are in Christ, if you belong to Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells you as a part of God's family. And now you have brothers and sisters who share a spiritual fellowship. Or, or as the ESV, a participation. It's the Greek word koinonia. It's a common uh, a, a burden, a common relationship that we have. This fellowship that we're united not only to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but to all who belong to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is empowered and imparted by the Holy Spirit of God. And we have a common interest. We have a mutual goal together as brothers and sisters. This fellowship gives us meaning in our lives and reminds us we're never alone. If we're united both to Jesus and into God's family by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and is working in us and through us. And in such a fellowship, there is great comfort, encouragement, and power. But that's not it. Not only does he say, is there an encouragement and comfort and participation? Yes, yes, and yes. But then he continues and he says, is there any affection and sympathy? These are two synonymous words to one another. Some of you might be following along in the NIV. Uh, it says tenderness and compassion. Some of you in the New King James have affection and mercies. ESV is affection and sympathy. Paul is intending these words to move the hearts of God's people, of to, to take this reality and this theology, but to move in their hearts so they can feel this truth. Not because these words are sappy or melodramatic or uh, emotionally manipulative, but because these words flow from the very heart of God, 
who loves us and sent his son to redeem us from our sin and to bring us into his kingdom as sons and daughters of Most High. In a world broken by sin, the heart of Christ is a shelter for the soul. And it overflows with, his heart overflows with affection and sympathy for wounded sinners and lost sheep, of which we all are. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All of us have brought burdens this morning. Cares, worries, concerns, what ifs. What if this happens next week? What if this happens? What if they say? What if this is found out? What, what, what? And we worry. But the heart of our tender and compassion, the affection and sympathy of Jesus says, I love you and I am working all things together for your good. You can trust me. My heart is not cold and reserved and at arm's length, but as a faithful father, I bring you and hold you into my strong and capable hands. No matter what happens around us, you are safe in your father's arms. Ocean Park, these words paint a glorious picture of the good news which is a retreat, which is a refuge, which is a place of restoration. The gospel is always free. It's always there, and it's always sufficient for the problems and the fears and the doubts and the failures and the sufferings that we face. Therefore, we can rest knowing that our safety and security does not depend on what we do, but what Christ has done on the cross. And then the confidence that we have that Paul, as he finishes up 2 Corinthians 13, 14, echoes these same things. That grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. These four words, these four graces are what carries us and unites us and allows us to put one foot in front of the other as we go through the difficulties of this life. And I pray that as we realize to come to know, to recognize and love the graces that we have received, may we in turn extend those same graces to our brothers and sisters. Because we are called, because of Jesus and his great humility on the cross, to give to others the grace Christ has given to us. So we see grace received and grace extended. Notice uh, in verse 2, continue on 2 through 4. The Philippian church were equal uh, recipients of the grace. However, as we have seen in chapter 1 and some uh, references to other places, there were cracks that were beginning to form in the fellowship and the unity that they had together in the body. Some bitterness, some dissensions, some rivalries were starting to form, and Paul said, listen, We can't do that. Look to Jesus. The antidote, his humility is the antidote to the divisions that are beginning to, the roots of bitterness that are being sowed. And therefore, Paul Paul calls the Philippian believers and you and I to Christlikeness, to grow in Christlikeness. As we gaze upon the glory of Jesus to emulate, to reflect that glory, that grace in our lives as well. And we see three expressions 
of that grace here in verses 2 and 3 and 4, 1, is unity. Unity. Good theology does not guarantee a good heart. Again, I love theology, love doctrine. I geek out and go in my library, my office, and you can see all my books. But far too often, the journey from our heads to our hearts is the longest distance in the world. It's 12 to 18 inches, depending on how tall you are. And sometimes it takes your whole life to bridge that span. What Paul desires is unity amongst the body. And that's more than having a Loctite theology... But it also doesn't mean a watered-down, kumbaya-type unity, the least common denominator between them. Paul wants a robust understanding of the cross, which is replicated in the hearts of his people and their lives, and that binds them together and produces a felt unity, a people that are united together as one. One, notice what he says in verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. All of those ways expressing the unity of those who are in Christ. Of the same mind is a mind of Christ, I think it's verse 8, is a shared mindset that Jesus, that transforms people's lives and their values and their priorities because their, their allegiance is to Jesus. The same love is the standard of Jesus, a self-sacrificial, self-giving love that we see on the cross replicated in the lives of his people. In full accord in one mind is the mind and love of Jesus are not a garnish on the side of the plate, but it is a big, fat, juicy steak. It is the entree or a big piece of vegan steak for you uh, vegans, but it is the main entree in the center of the plate. It is the driving force and passion and purpose of God's people. The gospel lived out and proclaimed is the driving force of the unity in the body. Ocean Park, the unity we have in Christ must be the priority. Our enemies will seek to divide and conquer us with lesser things along political, social, cultural, and personal lines. And so often they're so successful because we move our eyes off the unity that we have in the gospel to the disunity we have in all these lesser things. But we cannot allow this to happen. We must keep our eyes on the cross and remember that we are citizens of a greater kingdom who have been united by a greater sovereign, Jesus Christ. But how do we do this? Well, we're united in humility. In the humility of Jesus. Notice verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I want to be honest with you, and some of you this may be hard to hear. The Christian life is not about you. Let me say it again. You will need to write this down, despite what your mama told you when you were growing up. The Christian life is not about you. The Bible is not about you. It's about Jesus. And that's a really good thing. It's about Jesus' glory. It's about Jesus' name. It's about Jesus' honor. It's about Jesus' kingdom. Yet far too often we live like it's all about me. 
I'm the center of the world, living, blessed, and highly favored because it's all about me. Jesus is my cosmic butler. He's my divine genie. He's my uh, uh, heavenly get-out-of-jail-free card. It's all about me. Paul knows this about us, and he'll have none of it. And he says the conduct of a Christian is not self-seeking, or from an inflated self, sense of self, I'll show, show these peons what the reality of the gospel really is and I'll teach them no. But it comes from humility. And we're going to see that humility next week most brilliantly at the cross. But ultimately, pride that says, I am the center of the universe. I am the captain of my fate and the, the master of my soul. Pride is, is our heart's self-focus. I, or me, becomes the center of our worlds. And it becomes the focus of our life. And when that happens, our focus moves from upward towards God and away from our neighbor and our brothers and sisters and it moves to ourselves and what that does is it gives us an anti-God state of mind. We would never say that but in practicality it's all about me and it's not about God. My needs, my wants, my goals, my purposes are the end. And God, or Jesus, is the means to get those things. I give him what he wants. I'll sing a song, throw a 20 in the plate. I'll show up at church a couple times a month, maybe a year. I'll give a little more money if it hasn't been very frequent. But it can be all about me. But the thing is... Our pride, self-focused pride, is the, is the gateway drug, if you will, that opens our heart to every vice in the world. And it divides, it destroys, and it deceives us. But it's only the gospel that frees us from the deadly poison of pride, of self-gazing, the gospel calls us to turn our gaze away from ourselves, upward to God, and outward to our brothers and sisters, to our friends and to our neighbors. The gospel calls us to humility, or what you could say, self-forgetfulness. The cross reminds us, remember, all of this is, is built, if there's comfort, encouragement, uh, participation, affection, and sympathy, if all of those are true, and that you're safe in the arms of your Father because of what Jesus has done, you don't have to be consumed with yourself. You don't have to be the only one that looks out for yourself, because your Heavenly Father is. Seek first the kingdom, and what? All these things, your clothes, what you'll wear, and your food will be added to you. The Lord knows you need these things. And he's promised to provide these things. He said, seek my kingdom by looking upward and outward and away from our own hearts. But how does the gospel do this? How does the gospel remind us of the mercy and grace that we have from a good and gracious Heavenly Father? It points us to the cross. The cross declares that we have been freed from our greatest enemy and we are made his precious daughters and son and it, glares, it, it declares to us that God is for us, not against us, that God loves us and he will provide for what is need. He's defeated our greatest enemy and every other enemy, problem, fear and suffering is small potatoes compared to our greatest enemy that was slayed. And if we can trust Jesus with our eternal standing before God, we can trust him with our bodies, our money, our relationships, what we fear this week, next week, and the rest of our lives. Because God will care for us. 
Ocean Park, all who take refuge in the cross realize that the uh, uh, preoccupation with self is foolishness. And the preoccupation with self is vain. Keller puts it this way. He says, listen, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself. Growing up, one of the things that was emphasized in parenting philosophy is a high self-esteem. Got to give them a high self-esteem. Think high of themselves, because the worst possible thing is thinking less of myself, a low self-esteem. I'm terrible, I'm this and that, no, I'm wonderful, that. No, no, no. The gospel says it's not thinking higher of myself or thinking lower of myself. It's just thinking less of myself. I'm not so consumed with me. It's like Toby Keith's song, the great theologian Toby Keith, want to talk about me, want to talk about my, not talk about number one, mighty my, what I think, what I laugh, what I'll do. That's terrible that I, can, I can't get the benediction right every week, but I pull that out of the archives. And Keller says, true gospel human means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself. Because I'm thinking, how can I honor Jesus and how can I love my brothers and sisters? And th- this is amazing. In any relationship of two people or all of us, when we're all thinking how we can love and serve one another, our needs are being met. But what happens in a marriage or a relationship when one partner consumes everything and one partner just has to give everything, that's where abuse happens. But if you have two people in any relationship, parents, children, uh, friends, spouses, that are looking for the best of one another, they can serve one another and be free to love well and enjoy that relationship because they know I'm safe because that person cares about me and they'll work towards uh, helping me. And this is what gospel humility does. As Christians, we can say everything I need, I have in Jesus. I can trust him. Therefore, I don't have to hoard my blessings, my money, my time, my anything. I don't have to hoard these things. Or I don't have to be like Scrooge in just a little bit. I'll give you a half day off, Marley, but only use one piece of coal on the fire to make up for it. I don't have to be Scrooge with the grace of God. I can be generous and I can give. Why? Because I have received much grace. I don't have to focus on making nobody cares about me. I'm the only one that uh, that I can, to my own self, be true. I can trust our Heavenly Father because he has taken care of my greatest enemy. And he's given me his Holy Spirit. uh, And I can know that because of the cross. And therefore, I can look upward how to honor him. And look outward how to love my brothers and sisters. I don't need to be preoccupied with myself because God does a much better job caring for me than I care for myself. Look at verse, chapter 4, verse 19 of Philippians. If flip over a page, it says, and, and this is his closing, this theme that we'll see, and my God, our God, Ocean Park, will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You're worried about something this week, what happened last week, what might happen next month. God knows. And God will provide. Rather than turning inward and eating ourselves alive, we turn upward, I trust you, And we turn outward. How can I serve my brothers and sisters? Isaac Watt felt this way. This feeling of how can I be arrogant? How can I be prideful when I stand beside the cross? He said, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. My riches gain I count but loss. And poor contempt, hatred on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things 
the shiny things that I chase after, the, the counterfeit gods, the functional saviors, the idols of my heart that I think will satisfy, all the feigned things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. The antidote to selfish pride is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross which possesses untold encouragement, comfort, participation in the spirit, affection, and sympathy. Ocean Park, stop thinking about yourself and trust your life to Jesus. He is trustworthy. He loves you. He knows what's best for you. And he has promised to work all things, the good and the bad, for your glory and your salvation for himself. We don't need to beg, borrow, and steal to get it ahead. We don't need to watch out for number one. We don't need to only trust ourselves. We can trust God's mercy and grace at the cross and extend God's grace and mercy and love to our brothers and sisters, to our friends and neighbors. We're called to unity, humility, and briefly, we're called to service. When we're not focused on ourselves and consumed with ourselves, hoarding our treasures and miserly giving uh, what we have, we are freed to serve. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interest. Remember, we're not called to a life of self a denial necessary, like I'm not going to ever, you know, I'm not going to pay my bills, I'm going to live on the street, whatever. Uh, but, you know, take care of your business, pay your bills, get some, you know, eat right, exercise, all these kind of things. Um, we're, take care of yourself, be responsible. But not only that, but look for your brothers and sisters. Readily look for ways that you can serve and help your brothers and sisters for the things that they need. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, and he called his people to be a shining city on a hill. Reagan didn't come up with this. Jesus did. And it's not about the United States. It's about the kingdom of heaven of we who are in Christ are a part of this. Jesus said, you are a light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light so shine. Extend the grace of Jesus to others uh, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. How can we be a city on a hill if our pride causes infighting, bickering, and backbiting. All because we're trying to build ourselves up and tear our brothers and sisters down. Because we don't believe anybody has our best interests in heart, including God. How can we... Uh, how can the, uh, the light of the gospel shine in our lives when we serve ourselves and we neglect our brothers and sisters? How can we give glory to our Father who is in heaven when we're consumed with me, myself, and I? The answer is, we won't. People will see our good works and be like, I don't want any a part of that. They're just a bunch of selfish, self-righteous jerks. May that never be said of Ocean Park or the Church of Christ. See, until we look beyond our interests to the interests of others, knowing that Jesus will care for us, we will never glorify our Father in heaven. And this is the heart of the gospel. Jesus, for whom and through whom all things were created, Jesus, the very Son of God, who deserves all glory, all righteousness, all honor, every knee shall bow and tongue confess, that Jesus did not demand what he was due, but he humbled himself. Often the translations say emptied himself. It's he humbled himself and was born into his creation. And not as a prideful, not as privileged, not as powerful, 
not with money and wealth and education, but as an ordinary, lowly person. And he didn't live a long, productive life where he died in a ripe old age and he was celebrated. He died young on a common criminal's cross to take the punishment for our sins that we may have peace with God. He laid aside his glory. He clothed himself in humility and he died on the cross for our good and for our benefit and for our joy. This is the picture of the gospel we are called to live out and we we don't do it all the time. And honestly, rarely do we. But that when we focus on the cross and meditate on that, that changes how we live. We want to be like Jesus. We don't want to live for ourselves. We want to live for the glory of God, our Father, who loved us and sent Jesus so we can glorify him. Bar, what consumes your thoughts? Things that you want for yourself or how you can love others like Jesus has loved you. Sometimes you have to be deliberate and say, that doesn't come natural to me, I need to do it. I'm going to write this down and I'm going to think of ways and I'm going to pray, Lord, show me the way how to do this. Is your extra time spent fulfilling your interests and your desires and your needs? Or are you finding ways to help others in their needs and their interests? Does all your money, because Jesus says, follow the money. Does your money go to your future and your pleasures and your comfort and your hobbies? Or do you use your money, the extra money, after you've paid your bills that you need, that you need to do? Or are you generous and use your money to help others? To meet their needs for those who have little and fallen short. To make others future better. We need to pray, Lord, show us Jesus clearer. And when I see Jesus clearer, show me ways that I can love my neighbors. When I see the grace that I have received, tangible ways that I can give grace to my brothers and sisters. Father, teach us how to live for others because God so loved the world that he sent his only son to give his life as a ransom for many. All who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What encouragement, what comfort, what uh, fellowship, what participation, what affection and sympathy we have. Teach us to give to others the grace that Christ has given to us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for who you are and what you have done. So often we are consumed with ourselves. We're bombarded by a culture that, um, and marketing that plays to our wants and our needs and our insecurities. And Father, may the call of the gospel that looks at our needs, our insecurities, our fears, and says, you can trust me. I sent Jesus to deliver you from your greatest enemy, your greatest need. All those things are nothing compared to the grace and mercy of Jesus. May we come to know that and to trust that and in turn lift our eyes towards heaven and lift our eyes away from ourselves to our brothers and sisters that we may be the instruments of grace that points others towards Jesus. In Christ's precious and holy name we pray, amen.